Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly 90 minute deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Lisa. I'm a clinical psychologist and a college counselor. I am a parent of a boy in elementary school, a girl in middle school, and a girl in college. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, the pandemic is speeding up the mass disappearance of men from college. A great article by John Marcus of the Heckinger Report. Our question from a listener is, are there programs similar to the Trinity Dublin 2 plus 2 BA program? Our interview is with Christina Lopez, the Dean of Enrollment of Barnard College. Should you discuss your mental health challenges in your admission application? And our college spotlight is discussing what is the Trinity College Dublin and Columbia University dual BA program. Yeah, and and I am so excited about our college spotlight, so please listen to that. It's going to be a first time we've actually done this. The question from a listener was a college spotlight question, so we turned that into our college spotlight. So Lisa and I will do that, and I think you're going to really like it, and then we're going to have a part two next week. So please stay tuned for that. But for now, I'm diving right into admissions tip. And uh, the admissions tip this time is if you go to the Common App, commonapp.org, enter any college into your college dashboard and click it, the first thing you'll come to is the college details page. And when you scroll down to the middle of a college details page, it'll say recommendations. And it will tell you how many are required and how many are optional, both for teacher recommendations and for other recommendations required in other. And that should be your roadmap as to the maximum number of recommendations that you send to each school. So if you want to know what's the maximum number of, of teacher recs to send to a school, it's right there for you. Now, don't use the optional because it'll say required one, optional one, required one, optional two. Only The only time you really want to use the optional is if you have an additional teacher who you feel will add something that the original teacher didn't. Um, so it's kind of a twofold thing. If you want to know your maximum number, go right to the college details page, and that'll at least serve you for those 900 plus schools. And also, when should you send beyond the required? When you've got a teacher that will you feel will add a perspective that the original one didn't. Dave, you've got two in a row on me now in Remission's Vernacular. And so I'm a little salty over here. Right. So I think I found one you won't get, which is what I'm hoping for. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah. And the term is last dollar scholarship. What does last dollar scholarship mean? Last dollar scholarship. Uh, liking the liking the hesitation already. Uh, last dollar, last dollar scholarship. I would have to say that that is the last do, the scholarship that gives you the last dollar that you need to actually board the train <laughs> and go to college because you can finally pay for it. <laughs> Wrong. Whatever else noises I can make. <laughs> So, so last dollar scholarship, what this refers to is a common term you'll see used for outside private scholarships that come from corporations, churches, civic organizations, foundations, philanthropists. And um, I'll give you a, a few examples, like, for example, the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, we have one at KIPP that we do. It's a last dollar scholarship. What this basically means is, let's say the scholarship, well, I'll use Jack Kent Cook, for example. So they have a scholarship that goes up to about $20,000, which is like really nice, right? Up to $20,000 per year. So what they're saying is our scholarship will kick in after all the other free money you get. So we're going to look at whether you get a Pell Grant. We're going to look at if you get any institutional aid, merit or need-based. Um, and then if there is a remaining balance, that is when our dollar, our scholarship will kick in. We're not the first dollars. We'll supplement your existing scholarships that you already have. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I got you. See, I knew I could get you on that one. I now know. we've got a losing streak going, and I'll see if I can make it two in a row next week because I'm just a sadist over here, as you can tell. All right, Lisa, I've moved to the back of the classroom again. <laughs> okay. okay, friends. I have, I have picked... 
um, a big number. I had one all ready to go. And then as I was immersed in the article, Dave and I are about to discuss and doing some additional research along that topic, I decided to go with one that is in concert or along the same theme as our article. So the big number is 2.2 million. Any guesses what that is, Dave? 2.2 million. Uh, no, I can't. Because it didn't come from an article. It came from me reading other similar articles I could find all over the web on the same topic. Uh, I, I can't guess. That's too, too. I have no idea. 2.2 million is how many more women are in college right now than men. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. That makes 2. sense. 2.2 2 million. And with that, that's a great segue for you to transition to our article. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. It is a great segue, and it is another article by a well-known name, Mr. John Marcus of the Heckinger Report. It was a fascinating one. It is, quote, the pandemic is speeding up the mass disappearance of men from college, and the subtitle is, the decline in enrollment has been seven times as steep among men as among women. So, Mark, quite some shocking statistics here. John Marcus starts off by saying that when many men talk about college, it comes down to money, 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 because colleges cost money, and that often means going into more debt. And that, unfortunately, it seems that many men prefer the immediate gratification of a job that gets that money and choose to forego college. Therefore, while enrollment in higher education fell 2.5% during this past year of the pandemic, which is 461,000 students, it was seven times greater in men than in women, according to the National Student Clearing House Research Center. And they quoted, quote, we have lost a generation of men to COVID-19 which was uh, assist, uh, uh, the assistant professor of education at USC who st studied uh, the college going uh, trends of boys and men. And he said, this is a national crisis, according to Luis Panwan, Pan a Texas A&M professor. Uh, so the question is, why is that? And uh, there was a couple issues that they talked about. Number one, they said, it aligns with the perception that to be a man is to be self-sufficient, but to, for girls, uh, they often feel about uh, it's even more important to invest uh, in education for greater uh, uh, benefits down the line. And so before I throw it into this discussion, Mark, I just want to do two quotes by Mr. Pan Wan. And the first one is, quote, despite the allure of a paycheck, Versus going to college. Uh, sorry. I have, the, I have the quote right here because you stole my thunder. You want me to read it? Uh, yes, please do. <laughs> yeah, I've got it right here. Yeah. You, that was like, so that, I say we are really simpatico because I had this one ready to go. <laughs> no problem. So here's the quote. Despite the allure of a paycheck versus going into debt and spending years pursuing a degree, the reality is that a lot of these young men at 17 or 18 years old end up working 12-hour shifts getting married, buying a truck mortgage, and by the time they're 30, their bodies are broken, Pan Wahan said. And now they have a mortgage, three kids to feed, and that truck, and no idea what to do next. Well, that's a great segue, Mark, because I was about to say, let's segue into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I, I am so thankful and grateful to Christy, who's a college and career specialist in Virginia, for giving us this idea to talk about this. So a little bit of background. You know, uh, got an email, one of our most dedicated listeners, and who happens to also be um, a counselor working with these students going off to college um, in a public school. And she said, Mark, we're, it's killing me. It's breaking my heart. We're absolutely losing our men. Um, I love your podcast. I've been through most of the episodes. I heard the article you talked about, about Kenyon Zdeen saying, where are the men? But I don't actually know if you have really addressed the issue of what's going on with our men that we're losing. And I was like, wow, she's right. That's an incredibly important topic. 
And I actually don't remember, Dave, either with you or with Anika. Um, yeah, we talked about that one article from the Dina Kenyon when she, you know, acknowledged like basically, you know, there's affirmative action for men. Other if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have anywhere near gender balance. And guess what? The women don't want that either. And so we talked about that, but we never really gotten into some of the reasons um, why. And so what I said was, wow, you know, I'd be happy to do this, but we've got a lot of questions right now. So we're going to be backed up about 12 to 14 weeks before we can get that. But I said, here's what I promise you I'll do. I said, I will find an article that addresses this. And that way we can get this topic on much sooner. And, and Dave, I think this is such an important topic that I think we should, you know, discuss it today and then revisit again in the next 10 weeks because Heckinger Report did another really good article on the same topic. And um, let's talk about it now. And then sometime in the next six to 10 weeks, let's revisit it. I say six to 10 weeks because we've got commitments of articles all the way through 186. So that's just a little background. And I'm I'm really grateful to this. So several things going on here, you know, and this article surfaced a lot of the the reasons, you know, why we're losing men. You know, it starts out with a, a quote from a senior at Worcester, a Worcester High School in Massachusetts that says, I didn't think I was going to college. I didn't think I was smart enough. And I doubted this my whole life. And, you know, Dave, this got me thinking um, of what happens at an early age for, for our men. I'm talking about elementary. When women are more mature, um, well, they're girls then. We're talking five and six and seven year olds, right? Yeah. You know, they're 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 more mature. Um, here's another thing. Most of the teachers are females. And as a female, you're gonna think like a female, which means a lot of times behaviors that are just perfectly normal, age of age appropriate for where a boy is at, can be frustrating sometimes to a teacher who may not understand how boys think. And so boys pick that up and they kind of check out at an early age. So that was one of the things that that um, I want to explore. But, you know, I've read the other article we want to talk about, and that goes into that even more in depth with reasons and studies. So probably we can, that's a little bit of a tease. We can probably pick that up when we do part two. Um, another thing that I thought of, and the article talks about this, it says, Men are more focused on money. In fact, it says in the article, why would you pay going off to college when you can get paid, meaning work? And so one of the things that struck me is we're not getting good advising in the hands of these young men because all the research shows just purely from a pay standpoint that there's a direct correlation to the amount of education you have in your income. People with professional degrees make more than people with masters. People with masters make more than people with bachelors. People with bachelors make more than people with associates. And people with associates make more than high school grads. And high school grads make more than high school dropouts. It's a complete, consistent correlation. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you can't push back on me and say, well, I know someone who's working in a daycare with a college degree and they're making $25,000. Yeah, there's always exceptions. But in the aggregate, all the research shows there's a direct correlation between amount of education and income. And so we've got to get better counseling uh, to these young men if they're dropping out over money because, yeah, sure, maybe you can make $15 an hour at 18, but and that might seem really great. You can get that truck, you know, you can impress your girlfriend, whatever. But at age 30, when you're making 19, that's not so great. So I think there's an advising thing component that we, you know, that we really need to address to to take that on. I mean, it's a staggering stat. Seven times more men than women dropped out. And then particularly with the pandemic, and this is something that I hadn't really thought about until this article, which is how much the pandemic has exasperated this. Like ever since I've been in college counseling and in admissions, there's been a gender gap between men and women in college. but it's actually gotten a lot worse with the pandemic, you know, and here's some more quotes from the article. There's a USC professor who studies men who says, we have lost a generation of men because of COVID. And then the article also quotes a Texas A&M professor who says, it's a national crisis. 
And so um, I, I have several more things I want to say, Dave, but I, I, I wanted to see what's what's percolating in your, your mind. Well, it's interesting because for those who have been following minority admissions, this is not a new conversation. In fact, back in the 1970s and 1980s, there were multiple articles about the rising emergence of African-American females in college and the disappearance of African-American men. And it's interesting that many of the same postulates were made as to figure out what the reason is. I suspect that the, that the reasons are going to be much deeper than money. I suspect that they're going to be related to the same type of social breakdowns we're seeing in the white families in terms of marriage rates and so forth, as we saw in the African-American, as well as the changing technocratic nature of our society that's causing colleges to be, in a variety of ways, more appealing to women than men. So I think that this article actually just scratches the surface of the conversation and that it brings up far more complex issues that if we go back to the history of the articles written about African-American men, we are going to see a lot of parallels going forward. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things that the article does point out, uh, how the pandemic exacerbated this, and this is related a lot to social class, which will, you know, impact uh, people of color more, is the, the, the pandemic also opened up opportunities for money. Yeah. So you have this, we already mentioned that, hey, why pay when you can get paid? But the article talks about all of a sudden there are all these jobs to be delivery people with Amazon. My niece uh, worked for Amazon in Whole Foods stores, stocking orders. And it was like 15 an hour plus overtime, she'd get time and a half. And so, so it can help, you know, you have the little bit of the allure of, wow, I can turn around and maybe make 15 or $20 an hour. That's really good money. You're going to say something, Dave? Really good money, but they're lousy jobs. Well, they are, but you have to look at it from a mindset of an 18-year-old that maybe questioned their confidence whether they could do well in school anyway, yeah. that's maybe worked $7.25 for minimum wage before, and all of a sudden they're seeing, okay, I can work $15 an hour, and with overtime, I can make 23 Like, if we put ourselves in their perspective, that doesn't feel like a, a lousy job. In fact... You know, because a lot of times this is correlated with social class, these aren't necessarily people who are growing up thinking that they're going to be doctors and businessmen and computer scientists and educators and, you know, and engineers and architects and mathematicians. Like, that's not their baseline the way you and I grew up. That's good. You know, there were some other interesting things in the article. It talked about a Brown researcher said that men have, boys have a lower attention span. And they just have a harder time focusing and staying in school. And it actually gave a stat that men are 9% more likely to not complete high school, you know, than, than um, women. And so, I mean, I think this is such an important topic, Dave, that we need to talk about. This isn't one of those things we can just talk about one time. I think we really need to revisit it. And by the way, it does have ramifications for college admissions as well, because something I've always said, which is schools want what they don't have. Right. So the less likely men are to go to college, the more men become prized in the college admissions process and the more it creates a gender gap and makes it harder for a young woman with similar academic credentials to be seen as competitive. And I know that feels unfair, but we've said over and over and over again that colleges are concerned not so much with honoring individual merit, meritocratic behavior, but they're thinking about the entire class and they're thinking about the entire class and, and they'll get blowback from the women if they don't have enough men. And I think the national statistics are now at this point, 60% of the college enrollees are women, only 40% are men and made the point of saying that uh, several decades ago, that was reversed. It was 40, 60 women, men. And, you know, the social significance of that is if you're out of function, if every guy pairs up with every woman, half the women don't have uh, the person of the opposite sex uh, to pair up with in terms of social function. So it does create a social imbalance that goes far beyond just the academic realm. Uh, so it's a very serious thing. And when you, you look at the, the makeup of a college campus, 
Yeah, and 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 it and it also becomes a serious thing because if it can if the trend line continues to exacerbate, yeah, you know, literally, the professor at USC is going to be proven to be right. I'll, I'll read his quote again: "We lost a generation of men because of COVID." And the thing about this professor is he he's an expert in studying why men drop out. And so this is not just like you know some art history professor like popping off with his opinion on something. Like this is his area of concentration and focus in his scholarly research. And so, you know, boy, I hate to be so dour, Dave. I feel like this is not a pick me up article, but, uh, you know, we got to keep it real. In market, to be honest with you, it's a teaser article. There's a saying that statistics are like a bikini. <laughs> what? <laughs> I haven't heard that one. Where are you going with this, man? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Every time, oh. First time bikinis come up on our podcast, where are you going? What they reveal is interesting, but what they conceal is absolutely vital. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That was a good line. <laughs> I might have to use that one. I was like, oh, oh Dave, where are you <laughs> going? Article. You're out on an island, man. I can't help you. <laughs> but the bottom line is a teaser article. The, the the fact is, I, I don't believe the real reasons are just money. I believe it's multifactorial. I believe it has to do with the uh, challenges the family is having right now, the technocratic change in our society, and many of the jobs that are available in college aren't as, ap as appealing to men. And uh, also, as you say, the challenges that we've had educating men in a, in a new environment and with new rules. So it, the, 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 it's multifactorial and complex. And and we, it, it bears revisiting because I think as we plumb the depths of these articles, we're going to say, oh, here's another reason and another reason and another possible explanation uh, to lead to what's become a very ominous trend. So I, I just want to say that this is not the end of the story. Money is a factor, but it's much deeper than this. No, no, no. And I, but I mean, I didn't see the article as only saying money. I thought it hit a lot of different points, but your point is well taken because when I read the other article we're going to discuss in the next 10 weeks, it did bring in some additional factors. Right. But a couple other things the article said is that it says men are raised where the mindset is to be self-sufficient. Yeah. And so the idea of um, having a job where you can be independent versus going in debt and paying somebody can be appealing. And then another thing it said in the article and I thought this was a good point, you know, particularly for under-resourced families. It talked about how during COVID, a lot of times the the male and the female as well, but you know, the 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 male student took on a job literally to help the family with their financial needs. Yeah. And it was very difficult for some of these men to walk away from that. They literally felt like I'd be walking away from my family obligation. You know, it reminds me how like sometimes Dave, an entire family might work in the restaurant to make the restaurant, you know, work. And I, I never had thought about that before. You know, like what if you, you're literally wondering if you're going to eat? I mean, we saw how long those lines were at those food pantries. So the 16 to 18 year old takes on a job to help the family out. And then they say, I can't walk away from my single mom now. She needs me. So. Well, I, you know, I certainly agree. It's it's a lot more than only money. Um, I think the article really did a really good job, especially for more under resourced families, yeah. bringing up some of the struggles that they face. But it's a teaser, Dave. So we'll revisit it again in uh, six to ten weeks. Yes, it is to be expanded upon in the future. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. Okay, Lisa, we have a really good Princeton review uh, survey this time. I mean, I think they're all good, but I think people might like this one. So this is the 20 colleges that scored the highest reviews from the 400 students they surveyed on each campus on rate the dorms and the residence halls. Uh, now that is important. Very important. Yes. <laughs> and then next week we've got this is a dorm. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll start out with the positive and then go to the negative. Um, you know, I do want to say one thing about this. You, you know, obviously, the, the surveys are somewhat reflective on whoever you happen to talk to. The way I, I would encourage people to, to process this is I wouldn't encourage you to say, oh, my goodness, I'm really interested in a school and then it never made the list. So I'm kind of dinging it a little bit in my mind. 
I wouldn't encourage you to look at it that way. However, I would say that if it gets listed, it's probably pretty good. Right. So in other words, these 20 schools probably have pretty good residence halls and, you know, slash dorms. It doesn't mean that the opposite is true is because it's not on this list. It doesn't mean that they're bad. Right. So as soon as I saw this, the first thing I thought was there's got to be a lot of women's colleges here because in general, like when you do admissions, the question about the importance of dorms and residence halls tends to matter more to women than guys. So that might sound sexist, but I'm, I'm sorry. I, I've I, I've taken a lot of questions over the years and <laughs> dorms and residence halls matter more. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's exceptions. All right. In 20th place, Kansas State University, Manhattan, Kansas. 19th, we've got Pitzer in Claremont, California. 18th, University of Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. 17th, Vanderbilt, Nashville, Tennessee. 16th, Scripps College, Claremont, California. Did I ever tell you, Lisa, that that was my daughter's second choice? Yeah, Paris? no. Yeah. I think you're almost a little sad she didn't go there, right? It's so beautiful. Well, no, I'm not, because I love Davidson. Um, and, I, and I think she would have been happy there. But in the back of my mind, I thought, she'll never come back from California. That True. man is going to be a long True flight that. all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> And now Charlotte's got a special place in her heart. So, um, But I would have been happy either way. Number number 15, Williams College, Williams, Williamstown, Massachusetts. Number 14, Loyola, Mar Loyola, Loyola University in Maryland. Uh, sorry, Loyola University, Maryland. You know there's a million Loyolas. <laughs> yes, this is true. I had a session with a client earlier today, and I literally gave him all four of the Loyolas for his <laughs> list. He like wants Jesuit schools. He's at a Jesuit school. So he got Loyola Chicago, Loyola Mayor. Loyola Maryland, Loyola New Orleans, and Loyola Marymount, all four Loyolas. <laughs> I said, I promise you this is the last Loyola because I'm going down the list alphabetically. <laughs> Number 13, SUNY College of Environment, Science, and Forestry in Syracuse. Lisa, your magic wand. Number 12, Elon. What are your thoughts? Are you pleased with the dorms at Elon? Yeah, they're, you know, they're nice. They're clean. They're well-maintained. Um some of them, I think, are nicer than others. Mm -hmm. That's normally true. But Are you surprised they made the list? Let me put it that way. No, because I think most students there are pretty happy with their dorms. So my daughter was in the global dorm last year, and it, it is so nice. Um, she had her own private room with a living room. Well, that's pretty nice. And then her roommate nice. had a room, and they shared a bathroom. And, you know, they just the, everyone just came over and hung out in their apartment all year long. And that's freshmen. Yeah. Number 11, Rose Holman. They made the list two weeks in a row. By the way, I always, is it Terra Haute or Hot? I always say it wrong. Terra Haute, I think. Haute, Terra Haute. I knew you Midwesterner would know it. <laughs> Number 10, Mount Holyoke. Their dorms are legendary. In South Hadley, Mass. Number 9, Bowdoin College. Another place with reputation for amazing dorms. Brunswick, Maine. Number 8, Christopher Newport University. They've had so many renovations. Another place we've done a spotlight on. Number seven, Bryn Mawr College. Yeah, I've seen those dorms. They're pretty palatial. Number six, Rice in Houston. Number five, Emory in Atlanta. I definitely think it depends on the dorm. There's some amazing ones, but some not everyone is. I guess that's normal. Number four, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. They made the list two weeks in a row. Another place that made the list two weeks in a row, Franklin Olin College of Engineering, number three. Well, they only have 300 kids, so I guess it's not that hard to, <laughs> hard to <laughs> hook them up with dorms. Number two, Wash U, St. Louis, Missouri. And number one, this won't surprise you, High Point University. Yeah, I figured that High Point would be on there, what with their steak dinner restaurant and all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not surprising. High Point's number one. There we go. Next week, there is a dorm. So, Lisa, take our question away. All right. So this question is, are there lower threshold programs similar to the Trinity Dublin 2 plus 2 BA program? I'm not looking for an exchange or a semester abroad, but a full two years plus two years program. If it could be in mathematics, that would be a bonus. So, so Lisa, I absolutely love this question, and I, and I love it for so many different reasons. For one, you know this from, from working with me you know, in, in college counseling, um, something I repeatedly say, I never, ever have a client that I never learned something from. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just, it just never happens. Like, you're constantly learning and learning from your students, and- um, this is a question that I learned from, like a lot of the questions we get, I can just wing from the top of my head from getting them so many times. 
But this was a question that when I got it, I said to myself, what is the dual BA program between Trinity and Columbia? I don't know what that is. I need to research. And so I loved immersing myself in this research. And I loved it so much that Lisa and I decided we're going to turn this into a two-parter. So today we're going to talk to you about the program, what it actually is. And this is actually going to be our college spotlight uh, for, for today as well, because we're going to do a deep dive into, into this very unique program. And, um, you know, literally, I have to reach out to one or two of my clients this year, uh, Elisa, and say, you know what? There's a school I should have put on your list. Mm -hmm. And that's this program. So let's talk about it. So it's a dual BA program. And it literally is a dual BA. Like you end up getting two bachelor's degree. You get a bachelor's degree from the very prestigious Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. And you also get a bachelor's degree from Columbia University. And you spend two years starting out initially in Ireland at Dublin. And so you're in a, a major city in Ireland, you know, over half a million people, very historic city. And then you spend the last two years at Columbia. And so you get to be on two different continents. You get to be in two cosmopolitan cities. You get to have this international experience. And it's really designed for students that really want to have a global outlook on life that goes beyond study abroad. Like, you know, Karis had an incredible six-month study abroad experience. Uh, she would have loved two years. So if you're looking for something beyond traditional study abroad, you want to be with really globally oriented students. Uh, um, highly acclaimed students from all over the world uh, develop your language skills and your cross-cultural communication skills. Um, this this can be an incredible program. And so you you know you're you're full time at Columbia and you're enrolled in the School of General Studies, uh, the College of Undergraduate and so, um, Education. And so you do have to fulfill all the requirements for each institution. So like you do not get out of Columbia's core. You still have to do that. And you still have to take the additional courses that are part of the Dublin program. And this is a small program. And so the cohorts tend to be in the 40s or the 50s. And one reason why I hadn't heard of this program is it just started. It's It started in November of 2017. So it's just three years old. So it's a really new, it's a really new program. And it's, it's kind of exciting. And so, like I said, if you want to stretch yourself then this can be it. Now, when you go to Trinity, I will point out one thing that some people might find is a weakness of the program. They do have limited major offerings. And so you're applying to one of around nine or 10 different majors. And that's really it. Whereas, you know, in, in Columbia is giving you over 80 options when you go there. So the options are classics, which is ancient history and archaeology. Um, English studies, European studies, film, history, history of art and architecture, uh, Middle Eastern and European languages and culture, geoscience, and neuroscience. And each one of these programs, very similar to when we've talked about applying to international schools, international colleges, you're applying really into that particular major and you have explicit expectations for that major. So let's give an example. Like if, if you decide that you're interested in the classics, you're, you're going to apply to be a classics major, then they do have a requirement that you have to come in either knowing Greek or Latin or another language beyond English to the AP or equivalent level. And each of the programs has like their own, like film has specific requirements, history of the art and architecture has specific requirements, geoscience all have specific, very specific uh, requirements. Now, the good news is when you switch over to Columbia, all these different majors open up and you do, don't have to stick the same major. So you literally can do a major for two, you know, your first two years and then go to Columbia and you can switch majors and go to uh, a different major, you know, when you when you get to Columbia. And so I'm going to talk uh, about the uh, admission process um, and the selectivity uh, but I want to just stop and see what see what your thoughts are so far, Lisa. I think it's a really interesting idea, and I heard of this type of program more and more. So um, I know two kids who have done different programs like this at Columbia. One went to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and the other one went to France to Sciences Po. I hope I'm saying that right. 
to study political science there and then he'll finish up at Columbia. So, and I think they're really an intriguing idea of, you know, kind of getting the best of both worlds in a lot of ways. I suppose it's not for everyone, but I think if you're an independent student and you're okay starting abroad for the first two years, it could be a really fascinating and interesting journey. I mean, I look at Karis now, in addition to six, six months in Peru and Bolivia and Chile, which she did it, it during her fall of her uh, summer and fall of her junior year at Davidson, she's also been to Honduras five years in a row and, and to uh, Kenya two years in a row. So she's had significant abroad experiences, but she, she constantly draws off of that. Like you just be in a conversation with her and she'll be, that is so American and something that I might just think is normal. And like, she just has that cross-cultural perspective of how distinctly, distinctively American it is versus other countries. Absolutely. And I just, when you've had an opportunity to have a program like this, it is going to shape your worldview for the rest of your life. Right. And you really get immersed in that culture, I think, in two years time. Uh, you really develop a much deeper understanding than you would even three months or six months out. But, you, you, you know, Karis is absolutely right. Like there's nothing like going abroad to realize how much of an American you are and how peculiarly we do certain things that we just take as normal and the rest of the world doesn't. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things about travel. You know, one example, you know, Karis is always sort of she's kind of down on America for the longest time. And then when she was when she was in Peru, there's just a different sort of ethos when it comes to service, like in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Like we we have this culture where it's an expectation that the the server gets back to you quickly. They're polite. They're manly over there. It's just not that way. And she got to the point where she's like, I don't know if I could deal with this. Like, give me some America. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it can make you appreciate some things, too. Absolutely. Now, one thing that I love about the program is I love that they keep it small. That's going to produce such a bond. Like, imagine the friendships um, that come out of that. Imagine in the deepening understanding of other cultures, not just because you're in Ireland, but because of you're in proximity you know, with so many different people from so many different countries. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the richness to me of this program is not just being immersed in another country in a, in a world-class city, but just the, the community, the community component of it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about their admission process. So it is a holistic evaluation. This is not admissions by the numbers. I know we've talked a lot about international schools and how, they don't evaluate um, applications usually the same way that American selective schools do. Um, and it's very much a numbers driven process. That is not how this program works. This program works very much the way a selective uh, American university works in terms of going well beyond the numbers and really, really getting to know applicants in a holistic way. So the application opens up August 1st of the rising senior year, and it needs to be submitted by January 2nd. And you have multiple essays, and they're very important. Um, I know recently you had to talk about why this, why you're interested in this international program uh, or this international school and this international experience. And then you also had to talk about why you were interested in the specific program that you want to study, which is a pretty common essay for international schools in the UK and Canada as well. But there are essays there. And then recommendations are important. There's multiple recommendations that have to be submitted. And they all, all these things count a lot. They like CVs or resumes. That's something that they like. Not all schools like them. They like resumes in this particular program. And standardized testing is something that um, is important. It, it does factor in a fair amount into who is admitted and who's not. Now, because of the pandemic, they have waived and they, they've gone test optional for basically the current seniors, right? The class of 2022. So they've said they're going test optional for one year. Uh, you know, uh, but it's very clear that it's the only reason they're, they're not the only reason they're test optional is because of the pandemic. And so you can expect them to resume going back to uh, to standardized testing. And then and then the last thing I want to say is the interview and the interview is huge. It's huge in their evaluation. So and now obviously I did. I didn't even mention transcripts, grade, grade trends. Like I, I just that's just a given. Right. I Give me a selective school that's transcript optional. I've never found one yet. 
<laughs> so it's obviously they, they're going to require the transcript and they're going to look at the rigor of your courses and they're going to look at your grades and your grade trend. So I, I didn't even mention that because I just sort of assumed that's just a given. But when I say the interview counts a lot, it reminds me of the University of Miami and Coral Gables. So they have some specialized programs where they have like interview weekend and they bring in a bunch of kids to compete for scholarships. Uh, sorry, scholarship weekend. And they bring in a number of <laughs> interview weekend. They have scholarship weekend where they bring in a number of people to compete for scholarships. And I've talked to some high level people in the admission office and on a typical year, you know, they'll invite about 165, 170, about 105 come uh, show up because obviously these are strong students. They have lots of other options. And then they do a bunch of things there, you know, the tours and the panel discussions and all, all the stuff that you get with faculty and students and everything. But then you have your interview and the people that I've talked to at high level people in Miami have said, once you get to the point where you're invited for scholarship weekend, it doesn't really matter if like one kid had a 1580 on the SAT and like a 4.3 and another kid had like a 1390 and like a 395. The ground is completely level at that point. And really what determines if you get it is whether you blow the interview out. It's, it's, it's kind of like a job, like you're one of five or six finalists and they're bringing five or six finalists in for interviews for the job. And it really comes down to your interview. And that's kind of how this program is set up. And so what, what happens is, um, and this would be a good point to transition into the numbers a little bit. So they, you know, the program is still just getting its name out there. So they actually had, take a guess how many people applied, Lisa. It's not, not as many as you probably think. Mm, 187. Gee, you, you, how about 0.31762? <laughs> you're gonna and guess. I'm only and laughing I because I, I do that all the time. And that's what my kids <laughs> say to me. So it's sort of fun saying that to somebody else. <laughs> so, so that's a good guess. It was like 238. Mm. So how did you know it'd be so low? Uh, well, you pretty much told me it would be low. Yeah, I guess said, I did. <laughs> I mean, I just say my test taking skills there, right? You know? Yeah. I wasn't going to say 6,000 for 50 spots, right? Yeah. So so here's the good news. Like, as incredible as this program is, it is like not as hard to get in as it would be to get into like Columbia. Um, it is competitive, but it is not as competitive as getting into a place like Columbia or Barnard. So... So here are the numbers. Um, I mentioned the 230, 238 last year, 237. Um, so 40% of that 237 got an interview. So the way they have it set up, it's kind of like level one, level two. So if you don't get an interview, you're done. It's kind of like med school, right? You're applying to med schools. You, some people, if you don't get an interview, like, you know, you're done. So if you don't get an interview, you're done. Now, here's the thing. Um, of those 40% that got interviews, the overwhelming majority, almost 90% of them got accepted into the program. Mm -hmm. So if we go all the way back to the original 237 that applied, 35% of that 237 get admitted is another way of putting it. So 40% of all applicants get interviews, 35% of all applicants get accepted. So, you know, so it's a, it, listen, this competitive, I'm not trying to underestimate how competitive it is, but, you know, a basic one in three chance to have an opportunity like that is pretty incredible. Some more stats, 62% uh, of the students that are admitted choose to come, or that's the yield rate, so 62% um, enroll. And that's not surprising, like the kind of person that would go through a process like this, uh, you would think they're pretty serious about this. And they don't have that many competitors for other programs like this. We'll talk about some next week, some of the other programs out there like this. But I actually might have thought the yield might have even been higher than that, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a little bit of breakdown on the standardized testing so you get a sense of how students test uh, with SAT. So 35% of students had a 15 to a 1600. 43% had a 14 to a 1500. So it's come, you know, those are good numbers, right? 78% have over a 1,400, but they took 17% with 1,300s and they took 5% in the 1,200s. So you can see they're not just looking at your standardized test scores. That, that's an, when you see that type of score distribution, um, you, can, you can tell that they really are truly being holistic. And 
um, most most of the students had A's. Like you know, like A was the most common grade. It's not like everybody had straight A's, um, and it's not like they didn't take anybody with B's. But you know, A B student, but high on the A's was the is kind of the student profile there. You pay the cost to that particular college, and each college gets to set its own pricing. So the pricing is very different for Dublin than it is for uh, Columbia. It's a lot less. So that's another good thing. Like this, this would be a lot less money than going to Columbia for four years. You know, some considerable savings. And um, they do have a two-tiered pricing scheme. Part of the EU, the non-EU is how they word it uh, when it comes to pricing. And that makes sense because there's such heavy taxation in those countries. And so that some of it is being subsidized by the taxes you paid over all your life. But the pricing is quite reasonable for the Dublin side. And here's the maybe even, I don't want to say better news, but good news as well, is there's a lot of scholarship money on the Dublin side to fund that. Um, and they actually prioritize international students in their scholarships because the, you know, the price in, you know, you, in the EU is already so low. And so they are aware of the fact that, okay, this could be really financially challenging for, for people coming, you know, well outside the region. And so that's really where they prioritize um, the money. Now, when it comes to the Columbia side, you know, it's just like Columbia. Like you'll go through Cl Columbia's need-based analysis. For those of you who don't know, Columbia's in the Ivy League and Ivy League colleges give zero merit money. So it's going to be a need-based analysis. And um, they do promise to meet full financial need based on their own, you know, their formula that they use. And so the higher your income, the less likely you are to qualify for financial aid on the Columbia side. Uh, the more modest your, your resources are, you could get very generous in a very generous package uh, from Columbia. And um, a couple of things I want to say um, that I haven't shared that are really important to them in their evaluation process. They really look for people that know this program extremely well. Like the interview is not an easy interview. You're expected to know this program really well. So you can't come just, you know, sauntering on in there and be prepared to not know much about the school. And you shouldn't do that for any school, right? But uh, there's going to be a high level of expectation that you can articulate what you get in this program and, um, and how it will uniquely impact you and, and how it's set up and how it's structured. And then the other thing I'll say is they really are looking for globally minded citizens uh, who really want this international experience and are sort of change agents. So that's it, Lisa. Any, any co thoughts, comments, anything else you want to say? I think it's a really fascinating option. You know, one of my neighbors, you know, was the one who went to the Seances Po. And I think when the dad first learned that his kid got into Columbia, he had a financial heart attack. <laughs> uh, but then his wife explained to him that actually it was like really much less than going to Columbia for four years. And it, it all worked out. So I know that the student that I know, I mean, his first year in France, I mean, this is this kid's a genius. I mean, he is like off the hook. But he had a hard time, you know, like just adjusting culturally um, with the language and, you know, um, you know, the classes being in a different structure. But I think the second year has gone much better for him, you know, and I suppose that is pretty normal for all of us who immerse ourselves in a different culture. You're going to have that initial period of disorganization. So but I think it's a it's a great opportunity. My son, Thomas, who is nine says he wants to go to school in Ireland. He's been saying this for Oh, so you've got so a program for him. I was thinking when I was, well, this could work, you know? <laughs> we might have uh, helped him with his college list yeah, at age nine. He's already nine, nine. He's already got, he's done and dusted, right? You know? You're so. going to have to tell him, to, this might be one way to get a, a student to listen to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Either that, or mom just has to break it down and they give the three minute version. That's right. Okay. Well, you know, I want to comment on something you just said. So and I was actually talking to a student from New Jersey earlier today about this same thing, you know, and, and we got to the point where we've got an initial list for him, of like actually initially a list of 25 schools to look at, and he's doing his research and he'll pare it down. And, and I was telling him, I said, you know, I don't just want you to look at a place that you think you're going to have a good time. I don't just want you to look at a place where you think you're going to be happy. That's important. I'm not trying to send you off to some place for misery, right? Like, sure, that's part of it. 
course, you, you should look at a place where you will can be a home away from home and a place where you think you'll have a good experience and a place you can be happy. But it's not just about happiness. This is about being prepared for life. So this is a, this is a place I want you to also think what place might stretch me and prepare me so it can be like a trampoline so I can soar and reach my full potential. And I just thought about that when you commented on the first year being hard. And I also thought about last week how we talked about, you know, you you shared the story about your horseback riding and how you had a lot of failures and how those turned out to be blessings and that, that whole thing. And those what you were describing was growth pains there, but it was growth. Exactly. Sure, there were some pains, but growth comes before the pains. Yes. And so that's not a difficult, like, yeah, like, I think most of us throw us in another country for two years. It's not always going to be easy, mm -hmm. but that's where a lot of the growth is. Absolutely. Well, and I think that, you know, that kind of growth, it's life changing for a lot of kids. And, you know, part of the benefit you get is from experiencing that initial discomfort, that cognitive dissonance of being in this situation where it doesn't quite make sense to you or it's not the way it's always been done. Um, but I think that to really have to live in a global world, you need to know that a lot of this stuff is cultural. It's arbitrary and that that really sets a person up for success later in life. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa. Maybe we'll have some more international profiles. We'll do, you know, I will say this and, and Lisa knows this, uh, partnered with somebody recently um, and you'll be, you'll be meeting, meeting him. His name is Kevin and he's a great guy. And he's got a lot of expertise on colleges around the world because that's all that he does. And my focus is really more U.S. colleges and Canada to a lesser extent. And so I've sort of partnered with him and what Lisa and I do at School Match for You, a lot to share with our listeners. And so um, looking at having him come on the podcast probably every six months, we'll see what our listeners are interested in. Does he like we could, he could do something on summer programs abroad or he could focus on different regions of the country, I'm not sorry, of the world. But I think that's important. And I'm noticing so much more interest in international colleges, international universities, international experiences. It shows up in my surveys like way, way, way more. And in fact, I've been talking with Kevin a lot about this, and this could be one thing maybe you'll even talk about as well with him. Like, what are the reasons why there's so much more interest in the world? Right. But I'm happy to sort of have him doing what he does at his company. And I want to introduce him to our audience and um, expose people because there's just not only are there opportunities like this for personal growth, uh, but there can be tremendous financial savings too Absolutely. in certain in certain other international opportunities. And so uh, stay tuned for that. I, what I'm thinking about, I'm talking out loud here, but looking at every six months at sort of having him come on and and focus on a different region of the country and I'm sorry, I keep saying the country. I'm so myopic. <laughs> I know. The world. Get it. The world. The world. The world is our oyster, not the country. So um, that might be a good. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that would be a really good thing for us to see what our listeners want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. You know, would they want to hear more on summer programs? Would they want to hear more in the UK? Would they want to hear more on, on Australia or Ireland or, you know, um, <laughs> Asia? I mean, he he really works all over. And so, um Look forward to that in future episodes. It'd be so interesting to learn more about how education is different in different cultures and different countries. I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. Yeah. And just to be completely transparent, for it's a, it's a, it's a hole that I have in my practice. It's just I'm not going to put myself out as an expert when I'm not. So I'd rather bring in somebody who has expertise and partner with them and let them do their thing. And let me I'm, I'm big on stay in your own lane. Stay exactly. in your own lane, you know. <laughs> Okay, Lisa, so I'm going to throw out a lot of just general things about the program that I'm kind of impressed with and sort of see what pops off the, the page for you. This is kind of the section in the call spotlights with Dave where I say time for the stats, but it's more than stats. I kind of go beyond the stats. I've got some stats and then some other non-stats. So it's just kind of a hodgepodge potpourri of everything. Sound good? Sounds great. So the first thing um, that I, we never talked about before that impresses me is that every student has a thesis. So you have like a major capstone project at the end where you get to work with the professor. And I've always been impressed with those type of opportunities because one, 
you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with the professor, which is always rewarding, but then you really get to pursue something that you really love with a level of depth. And I just think it's great as a research project, as a writing project. And so that's one thing about the program. Um, I know I mentioned before that there's more flexibility at Columbia because there's more courses. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example. So, for example, if you were a European studies major um, at Trinity College Dublin, you're pretty much you know doing European studies. But when you come to Columbia, you can you could study French if you want. You could study German, uh, German literature and and cultural history, Hispanic studies, Hispanic studies with specialization. Italian studies, political science, and Slavic studies. So just wanted to kind of see on the Columbia side how you can venture out and expand a little more. Um, now, this is this is going to stun some people, but Trinity was founded in 1592. So <laughs> there, are only, there are only three colleges in the country, in the U.S., that were, you know, in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's Harvard, William and & Mary, and Rutgers. They're the mm -hmm. only ones you know, before 1700. And so 1592, Trinity's founded, literally 160 years before Columbia. Another really great thing about uh, Trinity is it, it's really in that downtown section of Dublin. So, like, you're within walking distance of all the historical landmarks, all the museums. And so if you're, like, the museum kind of person or you like to be where the action is, like, the location is real central. And as far as the size... So Trinity College has over 17,000 students uh, coming from 120 studies, or sorry, 120 countries. Now, when you transition to Columbia, uh, you'd be in the School of General Studies, which was founded in 1947, and that school has 2,500 students. It's originally designed for non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. It's kind of its, its primary focus, but it can be confusing because Columbia has like a zillion colleges within Columbia. There's literally like, I think like 21. There's like architecture planning. There's arts and sciences on the grad school side, you know, School of Arts. There's Barnard College, Columbia School of Journalism, Columbia College, Columbia Climate School, Columbia Business School, Columbia Law School, Dental School, Engineering Applied School. Then you've got, you know, nursing, Jewish theological. There's just so many different uh, social work. I want to mention them all. Columbia Teachers College, but there's zillions of colleges within Columbia, and the one that you would actually be in would be the School of General Studies. Um, a few things about Columbia, founded in 1974, the fifth oldest school in the country. It has, take a guess how many libraries, Elisa, they have at Columbia. 17. 22. Wow. That's a good guess. I think, That's a I think, lot of libraries. Yeah, I think I think uh, I would have guessed less than that. I think if it was a contest, you would beat me on that. But that's a lot of libraries, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, 79 Nobel laureates, um, a $9 billion endowment, um, and alumni in living in 180 countries. Um, one thing I never mentioned was the advising, and that's one of the strengths of this program. You get very, very close advising. Now, on the Trinity side, they don't call it an advisor because it's, you know, it's a different system. They refer to it as a personal tutor is the term they use. But the person functions like a guidance counselor. They help you with course selection and other, you know, personal counseling that you may need as well. And the counseling really picks up when you go to Columbia because they know that's kind of a big transition. You know, you're going into the big giant New York City with all its options. So they, it's even more regular when you transition there. Um, another thing that I don't, I don't recall I was mentioning before is housing is guaranteed for all four years. Wow. And that's kind of nice because... Both of these cities are actually really expensive. I know. That's like, amazing. Dublin is expensive and New York City is expensive. They're both expensive. So you really wouldn't want to be um, paying for rent at either one. Now, on the Columbia side, it's more it's like apartment style, too, which is kind of nice. You know, people like apartment style living, but it's still part of the uh, it's not like apartments living in New York. It's like part of the Columbia, you know, system. And one thing people should be aware of, and I don't know if people will think this is a negative or a positive both my daughters actually really like this a lot. But on the Trinity College side in Dublin, there is no meal plan. Mm -hmm. So you are buying groceries and you are cooking for yourself. Uh, but the place where you stay, there's a nice big kitchen there. And so um, when you transition to Columbia, you do have the option of selecting a dining option. Uh, but most of the students don't do it. Most of the students choose. I guess they got used to, you know, 
making their own spaghetti or noodles or whatever, and they <laughs> stick with that. And so, or DoorDash, they got used to yeah, DoorDash. <laughs> that's true. They have, may have DoorDash and all the other competitors. They may be doing that. Um, one other thing to keep in mind as well is all of the extracurriculars, clubs, and all of that that any Trinity College or Columbia University student outside this program could attend, you, you're able to participate in all of that. So it's not like you, you know, you can't be a part of sort of the whole extracurricular life. And for the statistical breakdown of who actually attends this program, 25% of the students are U.S. citizens, 43.8% are dual citizens, 29.6% international residents coming from 18 countries and the 25 US 25% of US students come from 10 states. Now that's based on the class of 2020 which had 41 in the class. So the classes have ranged I've seen they've had like three classes so far and I've seen 41 47 53. Um but those are some stats and some other things that we never mentioned earlier. What what jumped off the page for you there? I think um, my understanding of the College of General Studies is that they have a different advising structure, which is geared towards non-traditional students. And I think after you live independently in a foreign country, you're going to probably have different issues than you would if you just went to Columbia as a freshman. So I think that's one real strength. Um, I just think it's it's just gives you so many options, this program. I mean, you, it's kind of like the best of all worlds in some ways. Those are the worlds that you'd like to inhabit. Um, and it's just it seems like it just gives a lot of options. I also really like the idea of having this really international um, cohort. It's really globally minded. Um, that could be very formative for people. I mean, that could be like their friend group for the rest of their life in some ways, uh, if it all goes well. And um, I just think it's a really it's a really intriguing model. I hope more schools do things like this because I think it would really help a lot of students. Yeah, there's no doubt. I think you're going to see more more people, more schools do this for lots of reasons. One, we're becoming a more globalized world. There's more of an interest in globalization. And a lot of times people copy what other people do, like people, mm -hmm. you know, um, so there's no question about it. You know, one other thing I, I didn't mention, and you've alluded to it a, a few times that, you know, Columbia does have some other some other joint partnerships, and we'll touch on them a little bit next week. But one of the things that the program does a really good job at is uh, networking the students when they return from Ireland into the other students in the other mm -hmm. two, two programs, you know, that Columbia offers. And so it sort of expands your cohort of people that have had similar type of international experiences. So maybe you really you might like your group of 40, but maybe you're ready to move into a, a you know, a group several times larger mm -hmm. and meet new people. Mm -hmm but still people that have had sort of that international experience rather than, um, you know, a, a, another non-traditional student, you know, or another Columbia student. And, you know, that's considered, you know, one of the strengths of the programs as well, that you get to sort of keep that cohort, but that also sort of expand into, into, you know, this larger network. You know, one other thing that I want to mention when I look at this program, and this has to do more of a sort of a tip for admissions, uh, they, they're looking for people for, that have a passion for global, a global education. And when I look at the fact that, you know, such a sizable number of students that they admit are dual citizens. And when I look at the fact that they are really emphasize global awareness, international perspective. I think it's in order to be really competitive or certainly for, for you to stand out. I think you're going to need to sort of show that you've got a track record of that in your life. Right. I think if you just say, I th oh, I think it's kind of neat. It's intriguing to me to live somewhere else. I mean, I'm not in the admissions committee, and I just recently learned about the program. I've been trying to do a deep dive on it since I learned about it. But when I look at this and just sort of knowing how admissions works, um, I see them wanting to see that track record. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, most of the other rest of the world studies more than one language. So I think being multilingual would be good. Um, it would be help. It would be helpful if maybe you've traveled. Um, I know that introduces a class advantage, but I think it's just the reality. If you've been able to travel, um, I see that 
being being an advantage if you've been able to have certain kinds of international experiences or maybe maybe it was just something really creative that you did in high school maybe you took you know because someone could be listening to this and say well i can't learn another language now and i'm interested in this and we don't really have the funds to do some big international trip maybe you take like some coursera courses or edX or something you know and on different parts of the world Mm -hmm. Like those kinds of things are things I see the admissions committee looking for. And you're going to need to prove that you are, you know, we always talk about intellectual curiosity and how important it is. You're going to need to prove that you have intellectual curiosity for a global education. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, beyond just saying, that sounds kind of neat. I'd like to try it. Does that make sense? Well, I think, you know, you kind of, maybe they want to see that the person would function well in that environment because not everyone would do that well in that environment internationally. And then you've got a kid who's overseas, who's depressed or or whatever. So I think, you know, the program isn't for everybody, right? I mean, you're going to not have the traditional college experience. Um, So you're kind of self-selecting there. But if you're the kind of person who's confident, who wants to see the world, you know, is interested in that, then I think that's something that they would value in their admissions process. I'm really glad you brought that up. In, in some ways, it reminds me of co-op, you know, because when I talk about co-op, especially a place like Northeastern or Drexel, where you're living right in the city, it requires an extra level of maturity, right? To, mm-hmm. to maybe go live in Los Angeles or maybe in London or someplace for six months and to find your own way around, navigating yourself through the interview process. And it requires an extra degree of maturity to really do it well. And there's no question to me that's something that you're going to look for. I mean, me just looking at this program, if I'm in admissions, I'm going to be looking for maturity and mm-hmm. in, and and independence and just the fact that you're cooking on your own. Like that might be minor. Right. Uh, and adaptability, too. So even little things like, you know, you've put yourself in new environments through sleepaway experiences and different things like that where people can see that you have proven that you can adjust to new inform- environments. Mm -hmm. Um, because admissions is about risk and reward. And so when you're evaluating an applicant, you're looking at what are the risk factors, you know, and one of the biggest risk factors for something, somebody like this is, will somebody be able to adjust to a completely new culture, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is such a small program. This isn't the kind of program where they want to have like 10% of the people or 15 or whatever, attrition, attriting, you know, um, and nor do do they want 10 to 15% malcontents because, okay, I'm not going to quit, but this sucks and I'll just stick it up. I'll, you know, suck it up, but I hate it. So, you know, if I'm in admissions here, I'm going to have my antenna up for indications someone's got maturity, Mm -hmm. uh, adaptability, um, especially in international context. Um, In general, colleges look for people that are adventuresome. That's always something that's really, you know, one of those underrated character traits that's looked for. But here, I'm really going to look for that. I'm going to look for I'm going to look for adventuresomeness. I'm going to look for um, international intellectual curiosity. You know, another these another kind of thing that a student could do without spending a lot of money is be really involved in things like Model UN. Mm-hmm. Like any of those kinds of things right. that show intellectual curiosity for the world and a track record of it, um, I believe are going to make you stand out. And I can see that being the student, you know, that they take over someone that, you know, has a more polished statistical resume from things like, you know, maybe straight A's and perfect scores. So let's put a bow on it, as I say with Dave, Lisa. Um, <laughs> but we're, we'll be back next week to talk about some some other programs that offer a combination of a U.S. and uh, international experience beyond just traditional study abroad. Oh, great. I can't wait to learn more. I really, really want to thank Rob from Texas for sending in such a great question. Uh, I didn't acknowledge him earlier, but he really deserves a shout out. And we'll take up part two next week. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. All right, friends. Hopefully you got to hear the first half of the interview with Christina Lopez. We've never had an interview like that. And you re- you received it very well. Um, man, I've been really impressed with the emails we've received and comments and and um, and touched by them. So. So if you missed that part one, you really need to go back and hear that to set the context for part two, because in part two, Christina transitions and this time she focuses on the student and whether they should share a mental health struggle. 
or whether it will sabotage their admission chances. Then she talks about how the essay differs from what a student would actually say to their therapist, and students need to be aware of that. She talks about how the resources to support mental health can vary drastically from one school to another. She reflects on the admission profession, and she gives her grade on how well the admission profession is doing when it comes to understanding student mental health. And then Christina also talks about how they as an admission office discern whether or not someone is admissible or whether their mental health challenges are just too significant and too severe. And she makes it really clear that a lot of students focus too much on their struggles in their essay. And she talks about what she looks for when she reads a college admission essay. I think it's an absolutely fantastic interview, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So so that's also a great segue because just like you, there was some fear, trepidation, angst with you divulging to staff, divulging, divulging to your, your boss, all of that. That's the same way students feel. Yes. And um, oftentimes what they'll hear from admissions professionals is be authentic with us, with your challenges. We've all had problems. We don't expect you to be perfect. Feel free to trust us with your challenges. And if you've made progress, share that you know, and, and just keep it real with us. But that's frightening because when you apply, you are trying to get in. I know. And and there's a fear in the back of your mind that I'm introducing a risk factor that can hurt my chances in the same way that you had those same thoughts when you devoted to your boss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, the million dollar question is, um, how is a student to know when they should share something and when they shouldn't share it because it's just going to sabotage them when from an admission standpoint, because this isn't a, a therapist question, right? With a Correct. therapist, you would right. say, bring it all out. Right. But people don't want to do things if they feel they're going to go straight to, to the denial pile. And, and, and I think, I think we all have to admit that there, there are things that people could share that could make them less likely to be admitted. I know when I did boarding school admissions, you know, one of the things that anytime anybody actually had seen a psychologist in the last year or year or two, we required a report from that psychologist. Oh, wow. Yeah, we had to have legal stuff, check it all over. And it was a complete write up. And partly we wanted to know how we could support you. But partly we wanted to know, are are your struggles more than we can handle? And are we introducing someone into the community, maybe for couples? Examples of things we were really concerned about were um, severe anorexia and severe cutting issues because in a residential community that can just, you don't want that kind of thing spreading. So there were times when we would say, you know what, I think the problems are too serious for us to be able to handle. And so people have that fear that it's going to sabotage them. So what, just what are your thoughts? Because you've been so open here, but I think you're not naive uh, about how a kid thinks and how an admission office might respond if they don't have the support or the sensitivity. So just, I want to hear you talk. <laughs> you know, it's it's a little bit of considering the space and also considering your own journey, right? Like my, generally when I talk about writing about things that are difficult, whether that is writing about mental health, maybe it's uh, a past trauma incident, perhaps even, you know, something that has been extremely painful, maybe it was the death of a parent or whatever that may be, Uh you know, you're writing from, you know, that there's a source of of pain, right, Um, that that you're talking about. And, you know, the first thing I always say is like, where are you in that journey, right? And is this something that you feel you want to share? Because quite honestly, the the answer is you don't have to. There's nothing that says that you have to discuss all of these difficulties that are happening in your life. It is where you are on that journey. And so sometimes I say it's a little bit of the ashes and the phoenix, right? Are you still so in this that you're still dealing with this painful issue? You're still working through it. And that you're still in the ashes of it, right? Uh-huh. And you're unable to be, to step back and be reflective of it. Because essentially, if you're writing an essay, you're writing a reflective essay. And if you're not able to kind of get to that point, you're still in it, right? Versus the phoenix, 
rising from the ashes. It's a sense of, I, I know where I've been, but I know where I am now. I'm, I'm growing, I'm thriving, I'm overcoming this. Um, I'm able to have thoughtful reflections of where I am now and where I was then. I'm able to express a sense of gratitude, not only for the situation, but where I am. There's a healing that's happening. You can see the complexities, but the growth that has come from it, you know, there, there's that sense of, of rising above it. And so like, you have to kind of ask yourself, where are you on that journey? Um, and the perspectives that you're able to take from writing it, you know, I think there's always a sense of integrity that you keep for yourself. Like your essay is not meant to be a diary entry, right? Like you're not writing to your therapist. This is a group of strangers Mm -hmm. at a conference table talking about whether or not you should have admittance to uh, be admitted to a college. Right. And so there is, there is that sense of perspective. And so you are opening up your life to them, but I always say like, don't feel like you need to open up your whole life and share everything just so they can be connected to you. And, and like, you don't want to be admitted because of that. That's right? really like, important. That's not, Glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like that's not why we're taking you. Um, and so like having that sense of integrity that, there are pieces of your story that are only for you. Mm -hmm. You're like, you don't need to share all of those details, you know, ugly, gory, what have you in order to make them notice you. That's not what this is about. Um, And so it's being able to write from that reflective place, you know, and, and understanding that, you know, regardless of whether or not you choose to write about it or divulge it, you know, if you if you do gain admittance and there is um, maybe you are in a treatment program, um, you know, whether that is for an eating disorder or anxiety or what have you, A, before you apply, research what the resources are in their counseling center, their mental health resources. Is Do you feel that this institution has the resources to support you knowing your own journey? Uh-huh. And then once you're admitted to, you know, and you've decided to enroll there, reach out and be able to say like, Hey, I'm, I'm enrolling. What are the steps to make sure, you know, my medication transfers that I can be set up with a, a a therapist, whether that is there at your counseling center, or maybe I need more outpatient, you know, can I be connected to one in in the area? Um, Being able to start up that plan for yourself once you're there. But, you know, there's, the choice of whether or not you choose to talk about it is truly up to you. Um, and if it is something that you choose to do, just being able to think about it from a perspective of, am I, am I far enough away from where I can reflect on it and talk about it, how it has, I've grown from it, even if you're still something that's going to be ongoing, you know? So I, I, I think it's, it just depends on where you are. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, the recommended resource for episode 181 is a book called Colleges That Change Lives. And I kind of shocked that I actually haven't done this before, included this, this resource before. It's one of the classic books it's by Lauren Pope, and it came out in, in 1996, and Pope had formerly worked in education for the New York Times and became an independent ed- educational consultant. And what he did is just featured these book or these colleges that were small and where a tremendous amount of transformational growth occurred in the lives of students. And these are all colleges that for the most part, either B students or BC students, or in some cases, CB students um, can get admitted at. And over the time, the list has grown a little bit and it just became a movement. And so now there's actually a website I'd also like to share, CTCL, which stands for Colleges That Change Lives, ctcl.org, where you can learn all kinds of different things about these, these several dozen colleges. And when I was in Pennsylvania doing college counseling in the boarding school, we would routinely take our students to the colleges that change lines, college fair. So these schools travel as a group. But if you want to, if you're somebody who is looking for small school with a lot of personal individual attention and schools where uh, students experience a lot of personal transformational growth, 
and you're okay with schools that the average person on the street will not have heard of that school at all if you're wearing the t-shirt, um, but they can show the student outcomes are there, both job placement as well as personal satisfaction with their experience, then this is a book you want to look at. The book is Colleges That Change Lives by Lauren Pope, and also check out the website, ctcl.org. Now return to my interview, Christina Lopez. Where do you feel the profession is, uh, admissions, at, at being able to receive people's struggles and not deep six them, especially in a competitive pool? Like, is that something that you feel there's a lot of room for growth um, in the I profession? Do. Yeah. Yeah. I do I do think that there are, especially at least within our admissions office, and I think maybe it's because working at a women's college, mm-hmm. lots of students who have, you know, that sense of competitiveness, that drive, that ambition, it sometimes can manifest itself into perfectionism that can be unhealthy and in the struggles, you know, the mental health struggles that students come in with and, and what we deal with in our counseling center, we talk about that a lot, you know, and just in in thinking about, you know, that we are honoring the stories that they choose to share with us, mm-hmm. that we are looking at it in a place of, can we support this student? Um, and where are they in their journey? And sometimes, quite honestly, we don't make that call because we're not professionals. And so there are many times if we feel that we're uncertain, um, we might send that file over to our director of the counseling center who can give us a professional opinion, who can sometimes may say like, no, the way that they're writing about it, it shows that this is, you know, they're in progress and they're healing from it. And I think they're in a good place or what have you versus maybe not. You know, we do take into account the fact that, you know, students who have, whether or not we feel the student is at a point where they can advocate for themselves and create their own systems of support away from their family, right? I think that's a big, big thing. Mm, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, that that sense of of independence and self-advocacy to be able to move to a completely different environment and, and create that system of support um, is very key. Acknowledging and accepting where they are in their journey, um, you know, that this sense of this isn't something that's just happening to me or blaming the world or all of those sorts of things, but like this is a part of who I am. This is something that I'll always have. And these are the ways that I've built that support. And this is how I, I cope with this, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's a matter of how they move through it. And so I do think that there are some offices that might be better at thinking about it in that sense than others, Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it might be good to just ask, you know, um, you know, you starting the conversation about what supports are there will kind of give you an idea of how that admissions office talks about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, We'll give you a sense of, of how they, how they read. But I do think in terms of the profession um, as a whole, we, this is definitely something that we are going to have to start to grapple with as more students come in um, with these struggles. And, and certainly, I don't think that it's ever going to be the thing that's like, no, but um, there's always, it's a holistic review and there are always other pieces. But at the same time, thinking about how do, how do we evaluate this in a way that is honors where the student is, but also um, helps us to think about the the institution and whether or not we have what is needed to support these students. So several takeaways I picked up from what you said. One of them is this is not something a student has to talk about. So someone shouldn't Correct. necessarily feel compelled. This is not your therapist. And you shouldn't feel like you need to connect the dots to every aspect of your life. Like the admission office isn't owed that. Correct. Another point is uh, where you are in your journey may Maybe something you may want to think about is you even factor that at all. Like, are you in an emerging place where you can talk about some growth um, versus you're still completely stuck in the struggle? Um, another point that you you brought out is, um, are you at a place where you're able to self-advocate apart from your parents? That's one thing that we may be looking at as we evaluate. And then you also are really transparent about the fact that Listen, I'm not pretending that anybody can say anything and it may not have admissions ramifications like it can, you know, yes. if you yes. 
you you share about your whatever your attempts at suicide or how you want to kill your family. I'm just making you know using this as an example, but there's things that you can share that could be problematic. And I don't want to be naive and make you think that uh, I don't want to pretend that that could not be a factor. So I, I have one last question, and then this has been fantastic. Um, so one thing I know a lot of admission officers share, and I I would say I agree with this as someone who was on the mission side and now I'm on the placement side. There are a lot of students, they look at the prompts and the, the essay prompts, particularly Common App, and a lot of them sort of lead you in the direction of thinking that you need some type of dramatic story. And, and a lot of students have a tendency to write in a way that they talk about some of their shortcomings or failures or struggles. And this, this goes beyond mental health. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just, mm-hmm. and then they, they get stuck in that. I call it, I call it getting stuck in the struggle. Mm. And I've heard other admissions counselors say, don't feel like we need some big dramatic story. Something got out there some somewhere that you have to have this story of all these problems you've had and in your life and what you've done about it. And, and I feel like there are a lot of essays that are that way that not only feel as if they need to have this dramatic story, but people get stuck in the struggle yeah. without, without the breakthrough when maybe they might have been better off just talking about what they love or some other passion they have and letting that be a dominant impression that's left with the readers um, versus feeling compelled to have to share some big struggle and that they oftentimes still seem like they're stuck in it. Would you say that's something that you experience as a reader a a fair amount? 100%. I always tell students, you are more than the sum of your struggles, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and and the admissions essay is not necessarily about trying to garner favor because of the difficulties that you've had in your life or, to receive some sort of uh, pity for things that you've had to endure. Like that's not what this is about at all. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there are some in the profession that encourage people to talk about their struggles, Um, you know, especially, and, and, and especially more so towards, marginalized identities, um, you know, low income, first gen, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and quite honestly, a lot of those are traumas that are very triggering to now have to write about so that you can go to college. That feels wrong. Um, and, and understanding what happens when you start to drudge all that up, if you haven't really healed from it, and if you're not at a place where you're able to talk from it. You know, I I think that there is, again, you know, it's a choice and what you want to write about, but you have a whole life, you you know, like I always tell other people, like, yes, you can, you could even write about COVID and all of the struggles that you had during the pandemic, but you had lovely, wonderful, full lives before 2020 as well. It's not the only thing that's on the table. You have a smorgasbord of, of, uh, events and, and uh, memories that you can choose from. But this this idea that sometimes it becomes this kind of like a slogging through the difficulties of my life, just so you can say like, I've overcome all these barriers and therefore I deserve admission into your college. And like, that's not, that's not, again, it's not what this is about. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's choosing what you feel the admissions committee should know about you that will help them to see you within our academic and social community. Mm -hmm. Right. I love the essays that allow me to see the lens that you use to view the world. That's great. And understand me that that lens is an amalgamation of all of your intersecting identities, um, your ancestry, who you grew up with, who wasn't in your life, where you grew up, um, you know, all of these major pieces that make you, you, and being able to see that through this essay. And then also getting a sense of how your gears move, how you think, um, how you process information, because that allows me to see how you will, what kind of role you're going to play in an academic classroom. 
you know, especially at a place like Barnard where our classes are so small, right? And so it's really getting a sense of who you are. And if that struggle that you're talking about really helps as a vehicle for that, then that's one thing. But I'm sure that there are many other ways that you can illuminate that to the admissions committee as well. So I want to close with that because it was so good. Can you just repeat <laughs> it one more time, though, just in case anybody <laughs> missed it about the at least the part about the lens part? I thought that was fantastic. Show me the lens that you use to view the world. That is, in essence, the the beauty of who you are from all the sum of all of the pieces that made you you, um, and allows me to see that inner you and what you are bringing to this community, um, and not just about the things that you've had to overcome and struggle with, but who you are and how you think and how you see the world. Christina, that's a drop the mic. We got to end right there. That was really good. But the great news is you'll be back next week to talk about Barnard College. I'm so excited. Thank you. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Next week in the news, colleges face reckoning as plummeting birth rates Worsen Enrollment Declines, a great article by John Marcus of the Heckinger Report. Our question from a listener is, what are additional programs similar to the Trinity Dublin 2 plus 2 BA program? Our interview is with Christina Lopez on Understanding Barnard, that is part one of two. And our college spotlight will be a discussion on Understanding Barnard. Yeah, friends, you know, normally we put college spotlights up all on one episode, but Christina and I, we just got to talking because what we actually do in that interview is we take nine questions that you sent in, all from our listeners. I shut my mouth on this one. Um, Christina opens with her fantastic overview of Barnard. And then we had four questions from students. We had three questions from college counselors, and we had two questions from from parents, and I just ask the questions and let you be the interviewer, in, in effect. And um, Christina ended up, the whole time ended up, we almost went up going almost an hour. So for the first time ever, we're going to split a college spotlight up into two weeks. So you'll get part one on Barnard, and then on episode 183 will be the last part. Dave, what you got going this week, man? I know you got a new property, a bunch of new properties, keeping you busy. I have been rehabbing a three flat that we just purchased and uh, it's been, yes, uh, quite a, quite a adventure. And nice thing about when you purchase a property, it always gives you a lot of surprises. (laughs) So so I've literally been getting my hands dirty, doing some construction and rehab and some plumbing work, but that's fun. How long before you own all of Hyde Park, man? That's my question. Oh, no, not, not. It just keep, keeps me off the street. <laughs> <laughs> You're being humble and modest. Keeps me off the street. <laughs> Don't be surprised if one of these Daves, you hear Dave say, guess what? I'm not going to be a doc anymore. I'm going to be a doc like four or five days a, a month because I'm, I'm I'm all in on the real estate. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, God is good. So how about you, my friend? Uh, oh, I did want to give a shout out. Uh, we talked about it. The first African-American female to win the script spelling bee. She is only in grade eight. She's going to grade nine. And she apparently has two Guinness World Records in dribbling. So I've instructed her to mark to sign her up for Princeton right away. <laughs> you and your Princeton fixation. No, what's going on with me is I've just rediscovered my treadmill and I'm all into it again. So I'm loving I, I was on it at 5 a.m. this morning. So the only thing is I, I went out on the deck, Dave. You know, you've hung out with me on the deck. Yeah. I went out on the deck, Yeah. and I locked myself out there, oh, which man. meant I had to call Anitra and say, can, can you let me in and wake her up in her sleep? So I think I'm in the doghouse for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you better put that treadmill treadmill on ice for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or keep a spare key in my pocket or something. <laughs> You know? That's right. Me and the treadmill parted ways about 10 years ago because of my knees. So uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I can't enjoy the treadmill, but that's a good good exercise, man. Well, you rebuked me. I, mean, I was talking to Dave. I was like, Dave, I'm hardcore getting into bird watching. This is really fun. He's like, dude, you're too old to bird watching. That's grandparent activity. Get on <laughs> the bike. Right. <laughs> Get on the bike. So I can do both. And that's what yeah. I've been doing. Yes, you enjoying can. Enjoying my birds and enjoying the bike. That's right. Next year, grill hut. So w- wake. Work off a couple hundred calories and then 
grill yourself a 500 calorie burger. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, my friend. See you next week. Take care. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. And you can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listening app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. Well, we have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. David Williams and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer who fixes all of our many errors is Nemanja Modfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Boss. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianas Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourcollegemonkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week. <laughs>